All right, so while we're waiting for just uh, the last few people to, to join us here, um, I'll have our team just introduce themselves. You guys know who from uh, the Fit to Thrive team is on the call today, or on the webinar today. Uh, Grady, do you mind introducing yourself first? Sure, good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. I'm Grady Valensis. I am the Deputy Director in Occupational uh, Health and Safety at the IFF. Uh, I've been there for about three years and um, I'm happy to be here today uh, as I watch this Fit to Thrive process build out and I'm um, excited for all of the attendees. And I'd just like to thank all of the members out there that are taking advantage of this uh, valuable training. Thanks so much, Grady. Uh, Daryl. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Daryl Mendenhall. I'm from Indianapolis. Um, I have been a part of the Peer Fitness Trainer Program really since its inception. I think back in 2003, I am, my background's in exercise science. I also am a consultant, have my own company and do consulting work with fire departments in the Indianapolis area or central Indiana area. And I'm glad to be a part of this and it's a, uh, should be a good webinar. I'm glad to have you here, Daryl. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dave. Hey, everybody. My name is Dave Simesian um, in Michigan. I'm with the Dearborn Heights Fire Department, Local 1355. I've been there about 17 years now, and I've been with the F2T program for a little over two. Uh, we're happy to have you guys here. We've been excited to launch the virtual program. Uh, I'm sure we're all waiting to get back and teaching in person as well, but these webinars have been uh, a good, a good start for us. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. We're all here to help. If you have any questions, or I'm sure we'll be able to uh, make our emails available to you. And uh, thanks for being here. Great. Thank you, Dave. Garrett. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Garrett Kim. I'm a captain in the Hawaii Fire Department. I've been in the fire service uh, going on 23 years now. I've been with the program since 2012 as an instructor. Um, and then as a PFT since 2003, so going over 20 years now. So um, I'm, I'm glad you guys are here. It's great to have the, the tools to make your program successful. So um, really enjoying these webinars. Thanks. Thanks, Garrett. And Harrison. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. My name is Harrison Beforth from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Um, background is in strength, conditioning, and kinesiology. Um, I've been part of the Fit to Thrive team here for just under a year now. Um, not a firefighter by trade, um, so I've been able to learn a lot um, working with uh, work with firefighters across the country and just continue to support them with everything that you do. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping for everyone before we get going is if any questions do come up, there is a Q&A function on your Zoom platform. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A button. Anything comes up, feel free to type that in there. I may address it uh, directly to you or Dave may address it near the end uh, verbally. Um, so if you don't get an answer right away, don't fret, we will get to it. Um, I'm also putting in the chat for everyone, just our the best contact uh, email to reach us at info at fit thrive.ca with any questions you have about the webinar or the program in general. Um, and lastly, um, a recording of this webinar will be made available um shortly after we finish uh with probably within the next week or two um we will let everyone know when that uh, recording is available for you to review or share with anyone else thanks great thank you harrison uh so my name is dave frost i am a professor at the university of toronto and uh, up in canada i've been involved with the fire service i guess for about 15 years now um both from a, a research perspective um practical perspective been involved with the IFF since 2009 uh, with their wellness and fitness initiative, peer fitness trainer program, and now Fit to Thrive. And absolutely love what the IFF is doing. This is William. Um, he's going to be joining us today. Um, he's excited too. But uh, yeah, absolutely love what the IFF is doing. And I, I think that they're really, you know, re reimagining uh, what this wellness fitness space looks like, uh, not just for the fire service, but I think more broadly. And some of what we would like to share with you guys today is perhaps a slightly different perspective on, I think, uh, just from my experience anyways, something that we hear about often. And so over the past 15 years or so, the IFF has got a lot of questions, uh, comments about, you know, the whole idea of, of just being fit for duty. Uh, you know, what does that look like? How do we pursue that? 
Um, and so today we're, we're going to share a little bit about, you know, fit for duty, fit for life, what that means, you know, how we might be thinking about it. How do we uh, address it? Uh, what are some of the considerations that should be made? And, you know, it's our hope to, to share perhaps some, some new perspectives just, to, just on that very uh, important topic. Um, so with that said, before we jump into um, you know, some slides that we have for you guys, I'd just like to extend maybe an invitation to our team. Um, you know, I, as I, I mentioned, they probably field a lot of questions about the idea of fit, to, fit for duty as well. And so if anybody on our team has any uh, thoughts, comments on maybe even personally, what either fit for duty or fit, to, or fit for life means to them, and maybe as a secondary piece or, or you know, um, instead of, what does fit for duty or fit for life look like in, in your department? Like what are the, your members or your peers' perspective of those two ideas, of those two terms? Anybody wanna, wanna share? Yeah, Dave, I'll, I'll jump in on that one first. Thanks, Jerry. So, um, yeah, having a fit for duty. So if, if you're trying to gain uh, interest in the program, uh, a fit for duty as your, as your, I guess, your, your message that you're sending is a hard sell. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is if you ever ask any firefighter, I don't care what condition they are, they will always say, I can do my job. I'm fit enough to do my job. So if you're trying to get buy-in by saying, hey, I can make you fit for duty, you're going to have, a, you're going to have a big problem with that one. Um, fit for life is that, is that new thing that we're using is, is, are you fit enough to do what you want to do? Um, do the activities, do the, the things that you want to do in life. And that, that's a lot easier sell uh, for the individual members because it's a personalized message. Thanks, Garrett. I think there's two really important things you mentioned there. It's, you know, one is, is just kind of the messaging and the promotion of whatever program it is, you know, whether it's this fit for duty, fit for life thing or something else, uh, really trying to understand the needs and perspectives of the, the audience will be important. And then the other thing I think Garrett mentioned that's worth highlighting again is there, there are probably going to be some things that we either need or want to do or even love to do. And so it really is trying to put those at the forefront and saying, you know, you know, my efforts really should be or, or I would like them to be directed towards those things. Or I need to see some type of influence on those things that matter most. So really appreciate that. Uh, Grady. Thanks, Dave. Um... I've been retired now for three years. I came from Prince George's County, Maryland, and we really had no um, great program. We adopted CPAT a few years ago there, um, but other than recruit school, once you got out into the field, there really wasn't a huge expectation to maintain any type of fitness for duty or for life for that matter. Um, it's only been over the past few years, I think with the new generation of firefighters that you've seen better eating habits, um, you know, uh, better uh, focus on fitness because new facilities were built with gym uh, facilities uh, in them. But, um, you know, I think there's always been that suspicion or that, that uh, you know, when a department starts talking about physical fitness, you know, people start getting the, the hair on the back of their neck up about, oh, well, there's, they're making a move to get rid of people or they're going to start disciplining people. And um, I think the messaging that come, has to come from the department and the, uh, you know, uh, if you have a, a union local, local as part of your department, um, if those two entities are together um, in their messaging and they're, you know, using that, um, you know, maybe mandatory but non-punitive uh, nomenclature, um, you know, that's where you get the best return on, on that. But, you know, um, you know, that's my experience. So thank you. Thanks, Grady. Uh, I think it's another great perspective, but this is definitely something that is probably, it's probably resonating with a lot of the people on the webinar today, um, you know, some sharing similar experiences. Uh, Daryl or, or Dave, do you have any, uh, any thoughts? All good. So I'm going to uh, jump in now. And like I said, uh, my hope today is to perhaps you know, share a, a few different perspectives on, um, on the same topic. And we'll definitely touch on things that, that Garrett mentioned and Grady mentioned 
but perhaps couch it into a you know, bigger picture framework. So I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll, we'll get started here. Okay, so this is this is kind of what we're doing. So this all falls under the umbrella of fit to drive program, and it really is this idea of you know what does fit for duty and, and or fit for life really look like, and how do how do we go about addressing those those potential needs? So just to start off, I think you know having some type of definition or description of what what this is, you know, put us all on the same playing field. And you know both what what Garrett said and, and Grady said. I think highlights the maybe the physical side but that that fitness aspect of it. But when we're thinking about if, if it is fit for duty, um, I'd like you guys to think perhaps a little bit more broadly. Uh, and it really is the capacity to meet the demands of the job. And within the context of capacity, this is our our physical abilities and the, the fitness that we have. But it's also you know our understanding of the needs uh, for the, the 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 task requirements and our motivation to actually do those things. And so capacity is, is much more comprehensive than just the physical abilities. And we're talking about being prepared for duty or fit for duty. I think all these things go hand in hand. And so we can't really divorce someone's understanding from their abilities, from their motivation to do it. And so I think really couching this in capacity is important for us. Um, and then maybe just on that, so, if we're thinking about, okay, this is how we're perhaps defining fit for duty, you know, again, very generally speaking, uh, I think in working with, you know, many fire departments across the country, this, this idea anyways, is commonly assessed with some type of annual testing, whether that's a fitness test or some type of um, combat physical abilities test, but there, there's typically a test in place with, um, you know, physical related outcomes. And then, to address you know, the outcomes of that test, but there's some type of job specific programming that comes along with it. And that could be you know, exercise related or it could look like exercise or it could look more like um, you know, job skills training. But it's typically assessed with some type of testing and addressed with some type of program. Now on the opposite side of this, when we think about fit for life, this is, is, we can look at it in the same kind of light. So it really is possessing the capacity, again, the abilities, the understanding, the motivation to really thrive in, in life. But within the context of life, we also think about it within the context of, you know, free of or at the absence of um, injury and, and any type of chronic disease. So we're, we're couching this idea of really being prepared for life as, you know, I want to be able to do the things that I love to do for as long as I want to do them. But that's also tied to me being healthy, injury-free, um, without any chronic disease. And so then it's, well, how do we assess those things? Or how do we address those things? Typically, when we're looking at this fit for life thing, uh, one of the, I guess, the, the most common ways to, to look at this to see if we're, we're meeting those needs is just with the physical activity guidelines. You know, so are we active enough? And so it isn't necessarily tied to specific activities as perhaps the fit for, for duty piece would. But it's, you know, are we being active enough as per the World Health Organization guidelines? And, you know, unfortunately for, for firefighters, um, there's probably, I think the, the latest research says there's about 20% of firefighters that are actually meeting those guidelines. Um, and that's, you know, unfortunate for the job, but also for, for all these life-related activities that, you know, we'd love to be a part of. And then there aren't really any specific exercise recommendations to meet these guidelines other than just you know, be more active and use a lot of variety, do something that, that interests you. So I just wanna kind of couch the, the discussion in this is, these are how both those terms are commonly looked at. And you know, as we, we move through the webinar, like I said, I'd, I'd like to share perhaps some different perspectives. So this is, this is one, I think, really important point, right? So if we go back to thinking about, you know, how we defined fit for duty and even fit for life. Um, it really was based on outcomes. Like, do you have this thing in order to do this task? But the reality of it, it doesn't really matter. Like for, if we're thinking about long-term sets, like when we're talking about fit for duty, this isn't just, you know, can you do your job today? This is, can you do your job today, tomorrow, five months from now, two years from now, 10 years from now? There is no time off. Like this isn't like training, an athlete to peak for competition. 
um, you know, being fit for duty or you know, even fit for life, um, perhaps even more so, it really is about this long-term pursuit. And in terms of being successful in that pursuit, we have to think more so about the trajectory that we're on. Like what habits do we actually, you know, have in place, um, you know, day to day that are going to allow us to maintain or achieve the, these outcomes that we're looking for. Um, and that's perhaps going to be more important than where we are right now. So the fact that, you know, I can pass a test today or I can perform an X number of push-ups today, or I can, you know, carry a ladder X number of feet today. Um, that is perhaps less important than some of the, the habits that I have in place that are going to allow me to continue to do those things for the next five years. And so, again, within this context of, of fit for duty and fit for life, I want you guys thinking about long term versus short term and, and not the immediate right now, the, the results right now on a particular test. But what what tactics, strategies, habits do I have in place that are going to put me on the right path? So I can continue to do these things for as long as I want to do. Them. And I guess this is um, you know, just kind of an extension of that. It really is looking at this as a, as a process goal versus an outcome goal. And by that, what I mean, if we take the idea of being physically fit. So being physically fit is typically defined by some type of test. And I say, you know, what were your scores or what were the results on this specific test on this day? Now, the pursuit of being physically active, and so if you guys, uh, you know, everybody on here, if you think about your activity habits, you know, it's, it's not just what you did on one day, but it's what does a, a week, what does a month, what did the past year look like? You know, how do you fit being active into your daily activities? Like, how do you fit it in with your work schedule? How do you fit it in with your family life? And the pursuit of being physically active offers different benefits to being physically fit. This is not to dismiss the, the value or the importance of being physically fit, because obviously that comes with um, you know, specific uh, you know, benefits as well. But the act of being physically active provides different benefits than just being physically fit. Because there are going to be some people who, some firefighters, um, and you guys, uh, I'm sure, know some of these individuals who would perhaps perform well on a test today and so by the, the measure of the test they would be deemed to be fit but their activity habits are less than ideal so they're not someone who is active on a regular basis and therefore perhaps they're not um, achieving the benefits that they could achieve by being physically active they're relying on their current state of fitness now if we look at you know these these things that i'm listing here there are going to be some things on this list that are only achieved by being physically active, not by being physically fit. And one of the things maybe to highlight is there is overwhelming evidence linking uh, mental health to physical activity. There's a huge positive benefit to being physically active. The relationship is not between physical fitness and mental health. It's physical activity and mental health. It's the pursuit of being active, the act of being active on a regular basis that is providing that benefit. So when we're talking about fit for duty and fit for life, I would really encourage you guys to think about process versus outcome. You know, is this strictly a matter of perf me performing or my peers performing on a test and achieving a particular outcome? Or is it perhaps the, again, the habits, the processes that they have in place to uh, really take advantage of the benefits that are associated with physical activity. And, you know, with physical activity, with regular physical activity will come physical fitness, but it's not the other way around. So we can't assume that we're going to receive the benefits of being physically active simply by being physically fit. Okay, so ho hopefully that, that, that resonates a little bit. So I, I really want to just to highlight again the difference between physical fitness and physical activity um, in this pursuit of being fit for duty, fit for life. So I guess maybe in summary, if we're really looking at future success, and so in most cases, when we're, you know, the examples that Garrett gave and, and Grady gave earlier, um, 
you know, when we're thinking about being fit for duty and this being a career thing, it's a long-term thing. This isn't just something that we're trying to do today. Um, it really is going to be the habits that we have in place, not what our current physical fitness looks like. And so then if we go back to, well, how do we assess you know, where somebody is right now? And we rely on, you know, whether it's an annual fitness test or an annual physical abilities test, um, that may not give us insight into the habits that actually exist and therefore you know, how well this individual will do down the road. How prepared are they to handle the demands of the job? How well can they meet the demands of their life? Um, and so really trying to understand their habits, perhaps in addition to some of their abilities, might afford um, a better opportunity to intervene and provide some, some relevant recommendations. Now, this is also something that I thought um, it very, to be very relevant and, and worth highlighting. That if we think about, just to maybe reinforce this fitness thing. So if we were to think about D1 college athletes, I think that we would all say that they are probably more physically fit based on outcome measures than the general population. Now, this study uh, that was done actually looked at um, the physical activity habits post-graduation of former D1 college athletes and non-D1 college athletes, so just non-athletes. And they found that despite there being differences in, in obviously the fitness and the, the athletic pursuits that they had um, you know, when they were in college, there were actually no differences between their physical activity habits afterwards. And again, that means that just because I am fit right now does not tell me anything about how successful I'm gonna be at maintaining a physically active lifestyle down the road. So in terms of being prepared for life, Varsity athletes are no further ahead than the general population, unless they've adopted healthy behaviors or healthy habits that are going to allow them to be physically active once their career is done. And then again, applying this to the fire service, I have to say the same thing. So if somebody comes in as a, as a recruit, you know, most of the recruits, you know, with something like CPAD in place, um, you know, there is a, an element or a level of physical fitness there. But the unfortunate reality is for many firefighters, that's the most fit they will ever, ever be because the habits that they have, the behaviors that they exhibit will start to take over. And it wasn't about their state of fitness when they came on. It was more so the habits that they had in place. And so when we're thinking about how do we, we intervene in addition to, you know, again, obviously giving people the, the abilities to do certain things on the job, we have to be thinking about, can we actually equip them with the tools, the strategies to establish these habits that are going to allow them to be physically active throughout their career, because that's what's going to help them be fit for duty for, you know, for the, the, the entire length of their career. Now, just a couple examples to, to reinforce this idea. So first one, uh, so here's an individual, um, their, their objective, they were in pursuit of a specific health or fitness outcome. So they wanted to lose weight. And, you know, um, all the benefits associated with, with, you know, just weighing less. Um, so over six to eight month period, they wanted to lose about 30 pounds to better manage the demands of life. And so some uh, sample outcomes from this. So eight months post where they started, they weighed less, they could do more pushups, they could hold a side plank for longer, their aerobic capacity uh, as measured via a treadmill, a graded treadmill test was better. They were better able to recovery or to recover, and they had more self confidence. Okay, so from a fitness perspective, they were better, but they also had established these habits in the pursuit of this fitness outcome. They really focused on the on, on establishing sound habits that were going to persist long after they'd achieved that outcome, and so they managed to. Um, to establish some habits that are allowing them to do at least 10 minutes of activity every day. They plan where and when they're going to be active. They share their activity ideas with colleagues. So it's not just them kind of ruminating about themselves. It's, you know, here's me sharing with, with a couple of my peers. And then they reward themselves in various ways to reinforce the positive behavior. So when they are active, they reinforce themselves through various uh, mechanisms. 
And so then just reflecting on this individual, my question would be, well, what factors, either outcomes or habits, would have more influence on their long-term success? So does being able to do more push-ups, does that have a greater influence? Or is it the idea that they plan when and where they're going to be active? You know, the fact that they weigh less than they used to, um, is it the, the sheer number on the scale? Or perhaps it's the, the process that they went through, the habit that they established to fit in at least 10 minutes a day, which will you know, continue to persist long after they've met this objective. Right? So just, again, reflecting on this, is it outcomes or habits that's going to dictate where they are you know, two years from now? Second individual uh, in pursuit of a career as a firefighter. So Andre grew up you know, very active playing sports, would be described as having average, you know, above average fitness, uh, recently passed CPAT. So you kind of put that uh, context in here. So, you know, relatively fit, starting recruit school. Um, from an outcome perspective, able to meet at the moment, all the job specific standards for the academy. Can run a 630 mile, deadlift 250 pounds, confident in his physical abilities, understands the benefits of exercise, but the habits that Andre has only exercises when he's told what to do. He wants to be liked by the senior firefighters that he's joining in this department. Some of, or many of which are probably not as active as, as we would like. Um, he works on his days off, he's trying to buy a house. And so, you know, when he's off, he, his, his priority is, is saving money. So he goes to a second job. And the time he spends with family and friends, the people that are most close to him, is not active time. And so if we think about the habits that, that Andre has, they are not supportive or conducive to maintaining an active lifestyle. So again, I would pose the question, the fact that he can meet all these specific fitness-related standards right now, is that going to trump the habits that he has in place long-term? You know, is he going to be fit for, fit for duty one year from now, two years from now, because he was able to, you know, get on the job because of his physical abilities. Now, what I want to propose to everybody here is that when we're thinking about fit for duty and fit for life, so it's the same type of thing. Yes, it's undeniable that we need to have um, a specific capacity to meet those demands. So the physical abilities, the understanding, the, motiv the motivation, I don't want to dismiss the importance of that. But in tandem or along with the, the capacity to meet the demands, we have to be able to exhibit the behaviors, you know, the routines, the habits to maintain or achieve this, this desired uh, state of health and well-being. If you only have the left side and you, you don't have the right side in place, you're not setting yourself up for success. And I think it's also worth highlighting that if you have the right side, you may not be where you need to be right now on the left side, but having the right side in place is going to allow you to get the, the left side as well. The habits, the, the behaviors are really going to be what drives future success. And so when we're thinking about how do we define fit for duty or fit for life, how do we assess fit for duty or fit for life, or how do we pursue those two things? We really need to couch this in, in having the capacity but also having these supportive habits, these supportive behaviors in place. And without that, I think that we're going to be somewhat misdirected. So I'm going to pause for a second and perhaps, um, you know, just you know, go back to, to our team here. Uh, in, um, if anybody on our team, you know, just kind of reflecting on your own pursuit of being physically or fit for duty or, or fit for life, are there any habits that you've established over time that have allowed you to sustain um, a state of health and, and well-being that is, is supportive of the goals that you have? Yeah, Dave, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. I think, Thanks, um, yeah, I, I think we, as, as, a, as a community, have to change our perspective of what is, what is fitness and what is activity, right? Um, so, just being out there active, uh, whether it be working in the yard or doing extrication drills at work, that's, that's all exercise, that's all activity. And, and you will get that corresponding benefits. It doesn't have to be working out in the gym or on the bike or, or out running. So um, getting, getting that, that mindset change where activity is, is 
so many different things, not just working out. I think that's uh, that's awesome, Garrett. It's and I think it's a very mature perspective. I think one of the big reasons for my experience, anyways, that a lot of individuals, firefighters. Old, Dave? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think it's a mature. Um, I, I think one of the, the the big barriers to being active for a lot of people is their perception of what, of what activity is. You know, it's I have to to wear these things. I have to spend this long. I have to be in this space. And the reality is that that's just not true. You know, as Garrett's saying, physical activity or, or even exercise can take on many forms. Um, and I think a lot of people have, have experienced that in either a negative or a positive way, um, you know, over the past two years with the pandemic. Um, you know, we've been forced to adapt and, you know, modify to suit the situation we find ourselves in. Um, and so I, I think what Garrett says is, is, is very important. Yeah. Anybody else on our team? Um, or just habits that have been established that you think have been uh, helpful in your pursuit of fit for duty or fit for life? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not a firefighter, David, but I've, I've worked in, you know, the field of promotions, fitness and wellness all my career. And um, I want to say one thing you said in the very beginning about it's a process. You know, I've, I've done hundreds of, of fitness evaluations on firefighters. And one of the things that I would always try to emphasize is that, you know, where are you at today may not be as important as the direction in which you're traveling. Um, and also, I think one of the things that I try to emphasize and look at in my own life now, you know, there was a time when I was in my 20s and much more physically capable than I am now, um, that I'm in my 60s. But, you know, I think if we try to look at physical fitness as a means by which it can enable us to achieve an end rather than being the end in itself, and I always try to emphasize to people that, you know, look at it as a way, as a tool that can help you better fulfill your purpose in life, whatever you perceive that purpose to be, whether, you know, firefighting would be obviously a part of it, then it can help, I think, motivate people to continue. And another thing, you know, that I've had to allow for myself at times is that, you know, we're all going to fall out of the saddle once in a while, and we just need to give ourselves some room and allowance for that and and then just get back up and start over again because sometimes life interrupts things you know and probably all of us can think of times when we've been more fit than maybe we are now or that we've been less fit than maybe we are now you know i'm just coming off of a of a hip surgery and i'm not as functional as i have been at times in my past but persistence or understanding that you know i can still make a change and get back to the way i was and knowing that I have um, good reasons to do that, you know, as far as the, the things that I feel like are important in my life, um, then exercise is still a tool and I can get back on there and, and recover and, and regain a quality of life. Yeah, something you said there, I think it's extremely powerful, Daryl. Um, in terms of the, you know, there's going to be bumps along the way. You know, we're all going to have little obstacles that we have to deal with, um, work-related or life-related. But it's the habits that we've established that we have in place that are going to allow us to persevere and overcome those little obstacles and, and maintain the state of, of you know, being healthy, being active, being fit for duty or fit for life. And that's why it's so important to have those, those pieces in place and, and focus on those in addition to, again, the, you know, the, perhaps the outcomes that are going to help us do what we need to do. But don't lose sight of the value that that habits um, actually play. Luke, I saw your, your hand up there. Do you have a comment as well? Yeah, I think um, I, I agree with both uh, Daryl and Garrett. You know, those are obviously relevant to me too. But in, I think things have changed for me as well throughout this pandemic. What once worked for me no longer works for me. Um, and this pandemic sort of forced me to change my habits. But uh, so context cues I've learned are really important for me now um you know like laying my workout gear you know whatever shorts and t-shirt out you know, on my bed in the morning uh ensuring that i have snacks prepared so that you know hunger doesn't disrupt my ability to work out or or hydration whatever water bottle or um you know scheduling in my my calendar um 
you know, in order to time block something, things like that have been really effective for me uh, in this new world we're living in. Whereas, you know, I used to be going to a gym was my life. Now that's just not going to work anymore. Uh, and it hasn't worked for the, due to the pandemic. So understanding the different cues at different times in one's life, uh, you know, to sort of set yourself up for success. I think what Luke says there is awesome. Uh, and to me, again, it, it highlights some little things that, you know, we can do as a department, you know, to support our, our members in, in their pursuit of being physically active. Like in addition to sharing, you know, exercise recommendations, let's share different tips and strategies to embed some of these habits that will allow them to, uh, you know, embed physical activity into their day-to-day. -day. And not all habits are gonna, or not all these recommendations are gonna be appropriate for every, every individual, but at least sharing some ideas, some of them will resonate. And it's, it's the recognition that this component is equally or perhaps more important than just the outcome of the test that will allow them to succeed in you know, the midst of, of different obstacles that they're gonna face. Yeah. Do you have another comment there, Garrett? Oh yeah, Dave. So uh, since we're talking about habits and, and how to become more active, um, for those of you that have a designated uh, training program or period in your in your day in your work day, try and put that as far forward in your day as possible because the typically what happens is we're busy we call something comes up and it just gets pushed and pushed and pushed and to the point where either we're too tired to do do it or we don't have enough time. So the earlier you set that that workout in the day, the more chance that you're actually going to uh, be at able to accomplish that it's a great suggestion great idea so lots of little tactics that um you know that you really can use to leverage uh you know what's being done like the situation that you have to help establish these habits so the last um i guess portion of the, the webinar here what i'd like to do is share some things that you know we really encourage you to do but then you know maybe in contrast, maybe what not to do. Again, in pursuit of being fit for duty, fit for life within the context of there being specific outcomes that we need to, to have in place um, to be physically capable or, or you know, have the understanding, motivation to do what we need to do or want to do. But then also alongside, you know, making sure that we have these established, there's a focus on the habits as well. So the first one, uh, again, I just want to, being fit for duty is, is important. And so I, I think it, it's great to stress the importance of being fit for duty. You know, firefighting is, is incredibly demanding. It's unpredictable. It's chaotic. You guys obviously know, you know what the demands are. It's, it's high risk. And so because there is, is such a, you know, high risk and such elevated demands associated, then there isn't an, an, an element that we need to have or, you know, we need to possess certain abilities and understanding and, and motivation to do those things. That, that, is, that is fair. But I think this is something Garrett alluded to in the very beginning. We shouldn't place a higher priority on the four duty part over the four life part. Because as Garrett mentioned, firefighters are motivated by a whole variety of, of different things. And there's gonna be a lot of firefighters that are motivated to do the things they, they, they want to do at home. And so in pursuit of the home stuff or in pursuit of the, the work stuff, we are going to achieve similar outcomes and we could actually establish similar processes along the way. And so when we're thinking about getting people bought in, we're thinking about trying to engage them in this process. You know, we, we all want firefighters to be healthier, safer, you know, better able to do their job. Um, but really think about what does that process look like? And if we can acknowledge that we're most motivated by the things that matter most, then it's how do we market this? How do we sell this? How do we, we have it resonate um, you know, with the audience? And so let's place a priority on the for duty part, but perhaps alongside the for life part so we can actually address the diverse interests and needs of the population. The second piece, so do use a range of assessments to identify someone's needs and establish recommendations. That's great. You know, so a lot of departments have uh, different 
test assessments in place. It could be, just like I said, it could be, you know, set the physical ability test. All those components can be great to highlight different needs. But what we can't do or we shouldn't do is discriminate um, based on specific outcomes. Um, because those outcomes really just reflect a specific state. And the, the outcome of that test may provide limited insight into the habits that are established, the behaviors that are exhibited, you know, some type of routine that's in place. And so we could actually do more to hurt someone's progress that is being made by discriminating based solely um, or solely based on the performance of a specific test. So we just need to be a little bit more cautious in how we interpret or use the results of some of these tests in the absence of further context. So again, I, I don't want to dismiss the value of outcomes. So do prioritize outcomes. Obviously, you know, as firefighters, there are you know, certain job tasks that need to be done. And so we need to make sure that you know, firefighters have the physical abilities and the understanding to do those things. So we need to pursue the capacity to handle our demands. And the same thing is true in life. But we shouldn't prioritize outcomes without emphasizing the supportive habits to sustain those outcomes longer term. And just as an example, I may have mentioned this earlier, but there are going to be many firefighters that with good fitness as measured uh, based on some type of test. But the, the unfortunate reality is that if we deem them to be let's say you're good you have the capacity to meet your fans but they have no habits in place there is no strategy in place to sustain this their habits perhaps their their habits are actually counterproductive and so we look back a year from now it's like oh man like they've completely fallen off the wagon well this could have been predicted if we had looked at their habits and so if we support the outcomes with different tips and recommendations to try and establish the habits that are going to support those outcomes then I think we're going to put a lot more people in a much better place. And so in summary with this one, it's focus on the process in pursuit of the outcomes that are relevant. Okay, but don't lose sight of that process piece. And then the last one is we should be using a firefighter's demands, either on a work or, or life, to really establish some type of direction for training. You know, there are going to be specific needs and, and wants that we need to be addre addressing. But what we can assume is that every firefighter currently has the capacity to meet those needs. And so we can't throw everybody into the same uh, place that nobody, everybody doesn't have the same starting point. And so recommending that somebody start walking for five minutes a day can be the right first step for this individual to help establish the better habits that are going to allow them to stay, sustain um, you know, some of these outcomes longer term. So just because everybody shares demands doesn't mean everybody shares the same capacity. And so we are all starting perhaps in different places. And that just needs to be considered when we're thinking about what the recommendations look like. What does the first step look like? So in summary here, really think about taking small steps, meeting members where they are, not where they think they, not where we think they should be. And then I guess the, the last thing I'll say, and I'll go back to, to our team to see if they have any further comments, but the things that we do in pursuit of for duty are going to bleed over into what we do for life and vice versa. And so when we look at this through the lens of establishing better habits, there are going to be habits that we establish in our day-to-day -day, um, in life, perhaps things that, that were established before you entered the fire service, they're going to help you be successful in the fire service and vice versa. Perhaps based on, you know, routines that you have day to day in your job, some of that might bleed over to, you know, what life looks like. Um, and so when we can really look at things through the, the, the lens of establishing better habits, we'll see that these two pursuits are very, very similar. And there is this shared interest. And so as you guys, you know, move forwards and really reflecting on the, you know, the pursuit of fit for duty, I would encourage you to think about how valuable it can be to emphasize the things that matter most to your, your, your peers. And in many cases, that might be some stuff that, that happens in life. And if we, can, if we can help them establish habits in pursuit of those things, it's only gonna help them on the job too. 
So with that, I, maybe just as a, a final thought, just um, if anybody from our group, you know, has an example of something, you know, a habit that they have established in life that has then helped them be successful in the job or vice versa. Um, just to highlight the fact that, you know, this is really a shared, a shared pursuit. Hey, Grady? Although I'm, I'm no longer in the fire station, I, I certainly was a product of my environment uh, and my own bad habits. I, uh, I was pretty overweight when I retired. I wasn't sleeping very well. Um, I've never been much of a, a gym person per se, but I can tell you that since uh, I started working at the IFF on a, a more consistent schedule and um, with the pandemic, I started walking um, just every day, you know, five miles a day. <clears throat> and through the pandemic, I was able to lose about 25 pounds, um, you know, so just the simple change in, um, uh, and habit from just making it a goal to walk each day, five miles. Um, and then, you know, better eating habits. I wasn't eating out uh, at restaurants, obviously, uh, with the shutdown, um, I was eating, uh, better food at home. Um, but I, I always like to refer back to one thing that you always said to me was, uh, just small steps, big change. And, um, for me, uh, you know, although I'm, I'm still not, uh, you know, doing a hundred pull-ups or hundred push-ups a day, just the simple act of walking for me is, uh, has changed me for the better. So, uh, it, it truly is something that, um, doesn't take a, a whole lot of effort. Um, uh, although it can be intimidating to people to, to make that first step, but, um, in the end, I feel a whole lot better <clears throat> about myself, eat better, uh, I'm eating better and, um, uh, able to, you know, somewhat keep up with Daryl, even though he's like 40 years old. Thanks, Grady. I appreciate you sharing. Um, there's a couple of, I think, really powerful things in there that, that Grady mentioned as well. Um, I think it's awesome, you know, five miles a day. That's a, a huge accomplishment. And the, the weight loss piece is less important than the process of the habits that you've established because there's so many additional benefits as i mentioned that come with being physically active aside from just weighing less um and so if you were to weigh those two things you know five miles a day and you know that's the habit that's there versus you know weighing less five miles a day it trumps the weighing less every day um and then the other thing i, I think i would mention is that um, you know, which what Grady said is start small, like maybe five miles a day is, is the ultimate goal, but start with five minutes and just making the commitment to five minutes, making it easy, making it manageable um, so that it's harder to say, I'll do it tomorrow. I don't have time. You know, it's, it's easier to say if I, if I have this thing planned and so I need 45 minutes to do what I need to do. Well, then a lot of people are going to say, I just don't have time. I'm going to do it tomorrow. But if you said, I'm going to commit to even three minutes, commit to three minutes a day of something, that's hard. Ten push-ups, and he could do 10 bodyweight squats. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was his capacity. And he would do that about four or five times over the course of the day. And that was the beginning of him doing this small step. He ended up losing over 140 pounds and he's much healthier today so it, uh, like Dave said it doesn't matter where you are right now it's it's your progression and your direction that you're headed awesome thanks Garrett okay with that I will will pause um and Harrison if there's any questions that uh we can entertain um there's a, about five minutes left or so for questions yeah so far there was just one Garrett already answered it uh via chat but I thought it'd be good to bring up just to verbalize to everyone. Um, Steve earlier asked, and I believe he's referring to the fit to duty versus fit to life idea, is don't the two go hand to hand? Being physically fit allows me to be more active both on duty and in life. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think it's a great um, just perspective that they, they aren't different. Like if we, everything we do in life is gonna affect us on the job everything we do on the job is going to affect us in life and it really is one shared pursuit and this is where you know just kind of highlighting at the end that if we really couch it in the habits that we establish that's going to help us everywhere um so completely agree it, it is it is one pursuit 
Um, but what I what I would also say there is that when selling this idea to your peers or trying to implement some type of program, um, your peers may not share that perspective and perhaps because of their experiences or, or what they know. So when they hear for duty or fit for duty, that might come And so as Garrett mentioned earlier, that uh, a lot of people might think, hey, I'm already fit. I do the job every single day. And so framing it in that way could have some people shy away, even though your intentions are good and, and it really is all one thing. But just think about the, um, you know, yeah, just, just the perspectives of your, your peers when you're, you're putting them together. So that was actually the only question that came up that we haven't been able to answer. Great. Um, any last thoughts from, from our team um, on the, the idea of, you know, fit for duty, fit for life? Actually, we do have one other question came in from Josh. Sure. It's a longer yeah. one, so I'm not sure if maybe it's that open. Um, while a fitness program is a good thing, it's a great tool for those who come into the job with good habits for exercise and nutrition. However, not all firefighters are going to come in to the table with that tool set. How do you focus your program on equipping those tools? So I think this is a great question. One of the first things I would say, I, I would say not, not, I think it's guaranteed that everybody's not going to come in with good habits. And just given the, everybody. Just given the culture of the fire service, you could even come in with good habits and have some of those uh, change over time, given the existing culture that you're moving into. And so I think the one of the, the big things to highlight here is just the recognition that habits are important. And so, you know, when we're trying to institute a program, and this is something Fit to Thrive is really trying to do, where we're putting, you know, behaviors at the forefront. So yes, we want people to be more fit, like from a physical perspective, but it's how do we support that um, you know, with, with different behaviors and why do people, why do firefighters adopt the behaviors that they do? You know, are there things that we can do to support positive behaviors? And so just making sure that your program up front is acknowledging um, the importance of that will go a long way. And then with Fit to Thrive, you know, we're, we're gonna be sharing you know, different strategies and resources to make sure that, uh, or at least not to make sure, but to, to give you some insight or, or thoughts about how some of these things can be embedded with an existing infrastructure that you guys have within your own departments. That looks to be it, nothing else has come up. Um, just while we still have everyone, Dave, if you don't mind. Um, yep. I mentioned earlier that this, this recording will be available. We actually have a couple other webinars that are currently posted. Um, so I will put that uh, a link to that URL so you can watch this recordings if interested in the chat. Um, it's there. We also ask um, that if you don't mind taking a few minutes and doing a quick survey for us. Um, this is something that we can just get feedback from you. It's completely anonymous. Um, we, the feedback is very valuable that we can take and then ensure that we're providing the highest level of program to all of you. Um, and lastly, I put this earlier in the chat, but I'll put it again. If you have any questions, um, anything you want to, or any comments, um, you can reach us at info at fittothrive.ca. I put that email in the chat as well. Uh, feel free to reach out to us with anything. And on that note, actually, it looks like one more question has come in, Dave. Yep. Yep. Um, this is from Steve again. Um, a problem in fire stations equipped with gym equipment is the knowledge in doing the right exercises. How does a fire department employ programming on an affordability basis? Yeah, this, to me, this is a, it's a great question as well. And I think some of this stems from that idea of what the perspective of what exercise looks like. Um, so there are a lot of ways to become fit for duty or fit for life in terms of the tools, the exercises, the activities that we use. and in the absence of money for equipment or in the absence of, of space or even just equipment in a station, I think it just, it changes the, the tools or strategies that are used. And, and again, this is a, a huge part of the Fit the Thrive, Thrive program is we'll be trying to do is highlight 
the diversity and options that exist, depending on, you know, where you and your department find yourself. So if you have no money, if you have no equipment, how can I still achieve these shared goals, whether process wise or outcome wise? So lots of different options. And, uh, you know, we look to look forward to working with everybody on the call and your departments in, in helping you uh, identify what strategies might be appropriate for you, given the, the state you find yourself in. Okay, on that, uh, I just want to say on behalf of our whole team, um, you know, really appreciate you guys taking some time to, to spend with us uh, on this Friday. Um, please, as Harrison check, uh, said, check out the additional webinars, workshops, courses that we have. We're going to continue to offer these on a you know, weekly, bi-weekly basis um, to support you guys in what you're doing. If you do have questions, let us know. And we'll either address them directly or even turn them into another webinar that would be a benefit to a larger, uh, a larger audience. So again, thank you so much.